Pushkin. So, of course, I knew about the wage gap. You know, on average, women earn less than men for comparable work. What I did not know about was the investing gap. Even when you control for variables like wealth and income, women are much less likely than men to invest in, you know, real estate or the stock market. And that, of course, means that women are much less likely than men to build wealth over time. And this problem has gone largely unnoticed and unaddressed, in part because most investment companies have been run by and for men. I'm Jacob Goldstein, and this is What's Your Problem, the show where entrepreneurs and engineers talk about how they're going to change the world once they solve a few problems. My guest today is Sally Krawcheck, founder and CEO of Elevest. It's an investment firm aimed at women, and it has around $1.5 billion in assets under management. Sally's problem is this. How do you convince women to become investors? Before Sally founded Elevest, she spent decades working in finance. And as she worked her way up to top jobs at Citibank and Merrill Lynch, one thing kept being true. She was often the only woman in the room. She told me that started way back at her first job in finance at Solomon Brothers back in the late 80s. It was stay up all night, run for the airplane, work on deals, sharp elbows, lots of gender discrimination, all the stuff you've read, just take it, you know, if that's a five, take it to a 10. Well, what was it like being a woman there? <laughs> it was horrible. It was horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> Everything about it. I remember my literally my very first day, literally my very first day. I'm sitting there. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. I went to UNC. I was wearing the absolute most professional thing you could buy in the city of Charleston, South Carolina. It was a, you know, sort of loosely fitting jacket and a loosely fitting sort of longish skirt. And I remember standing by my desk, oh, look, here are my pencils, and smelled cigar smoke. And a man went by smoking a cigar. He pauses. He looks at me. He says, what is that effing discount maternity wear? He kept going. And I said to someone, who the heck was that? Oh, that's the head of the department. Your boss's 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 boss. From there on, it got worse. And it's interesting because I read now research that sexual harassment, you think it comes from powerful men, but apparently it comes from men who want to be powerful. And so for those individuals who were a level or two ahead of me, you know, in the evening, putting Xerox copies of male genitalia on my desk. I, I on one level, I know I shouldn't be surprised. Like I read Liar's mm -hmm. Poker, I've read research, and yet mm -hmm. it's strangely shocking. still shocking, shocking to me. I know better I'm, than to be shocked, and yet I'm shocked. I know, I know, but it, there was nothing I could do except just keep going. I had signed a lease, a 12-month lease in New York City that I did not have money in the bank, of course, to pay for. My parents did, ha did not have money in the bank to pay for. All I could do was keep going to work and just survive through it. And over time, be good enough, be indispensable enough that that stuff had to fall away. And then over time, as I became more senior, of course, don't don't stand for it. And it seems like, I mean, this is jumping ahead a bit now, but it mm -hmm. seems like you eventually really kind of found your your niche, your groove in finance mm -hmm. as an analyst. Um, mm -hmm. tell, tell me about that part of your career. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. And, and probably part of, well, it went to things I love to do. I I'm, your your listeners going to be like she's such a she's such a goober. Um, I love to get lost in we're, we're earnings. We're goober. Models. We're goober people. It's a very Sorry goober friendly that. podcast. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know I will start looking at an, at an Excel spreadsheet or Google Sheets, and I will look up and four hours have passed, and I'm how did that happen? That was being a research analyst. I loved it. It probably helped that one I found that job at Sanford Bernstein, which you know, was a group of, I, I used to call it the Island of the Misfit Toys. It was not where traditional Wall Street pulled from. Um, and 
that the sexism sort of fell away because you were an individual contributor. You weren't working on teams and jostling with folks and people wanted to make money. And if you could help them make money or have insights that others didn't, there was something about it where the sexism sort of fell away. And in fact, I would argue that being a woman probably helped me because if I was competing against 15 men, you couldn't forget me. And particularly if the research was any good, which humbly it was, you couldn't forget me. So there's there's one piece of research in particular that seems to sort of stand out. And that was this report you wrote about American general. Uh, <laughs> tell me tell me just a little bit about that. Like very yeah. briefly, like wh- what was that? When yeah. was that? Why was it important for your So it was actually my first piece of research before I knew how the game was supposed to be played, which, which was a benefit. And it, American General was an insurance company, and they were finding growth in lending and making loans. And the analyst at the time said, oh, look, they've found this avenue to growth. This is exciting. This is an outperform. And I, using the same information other analysts had, looked at it and said, you know, the, the um, credit quality appears fine when you look at it, you know, versus today's loans. But credit quality only emerges over time, right? Bad credit quality. So let me lag the ratios and see how today's credit quality looks versus last year's loans. The answer was terrible. So I wrote this up. I said, you know what? They're growing because they're they're reducing their credit standards and making loans other people won't. This is going to blow up. I published it. I called it Woe Nelly. The company was furious. Other analysts were furious. And a couple months later, damn it if it didn't blow up. And when the bubble burst and we stood alone and our business exploded, I was on the cover of Fortune as the last honest analyst, which is still, still when I think back on it, is like the most surreal thing that ever happened to me. Uh, say more. Surreal how? Because your face is on the cover of a magazine <laughs> and you walk through the airport, and you're like, there's my face on the cover of a magazine. And by the way, the face on the cover was bigger than my own actual face, I think. Did you hold it up? I would have definitely held it up to At see. One point I, I held it up and tried to yeah. track it. And it was even so big that there was a little mole on my chin that I thought I'd have removed. <laughs> and then I started the magazine. I'm like, I didn't, they didn't fully get that little mole, did they? So, so you're like nerd famous at this point. You're Wall Street yes. famous, right? <laughs> um, you, you know, you ascend, right? Uh, you have a, a very uh, senior job at uh, was it uh, Smith Barney within City, yeah. Yeah. and you lose that job, and then you have a very senior job at Merrill Lynch when it's part of Bank of America after the mm-hmm. financial crisis, mm-hmm. and you lose that job. Yeah, thanks uh, for bringing that up. Really yeah, appreciate I mean, you bringing you know, it's, it's, The <laughs> like story has a happy ending. The story has better. a happy ending. Um, <laughs> we, know, we know it's going to work out. But t- tell, me, tell me about losing that second job. I mean, it seems like that sets you up to found Elvest. So, so yeah. lose, tell me yeah. about, about losing the Merrill yeah. job. Yeah, so it was, it was a shocker, and it wasn't. Um, it wasn't because, um, I knew the CEO and I were not big buddies. He never stopped by my office on the way to the leadership team meeting and said, Hey, Sally, can I run something by you? You know, I would, I was the last on the leadership team to know it was a surprise because we had turned the business around. The business was growing. We were gaining share. We were beating plan. And I remember you know, saying to my husband, I mean, he doesn't, we're not getting along, but the results are there. And we were like, well, if the results are there and I would check in with his, you know, entourage or am I doing okay? Yeah, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. Um, and then, you know, one day after, you know, just as I'm feeling like this is great, I was pulled into his office and he said, we're going to reorg. You're out. Um, we're going to have this gentleman, um, who happened to be, a white man in his, I think, early 60s, who had worked with the, you know, the CEO in the past, who had never run a wealth management business. But we, you know, essentially, we think this guy who's never done this job before can do a better job than you when it's what you do in your career. And you've you've actually turned the business around. Bye. And, And just like, what? And, and sort of hearing, well, we don't think you're a culture fit. 
which is, you know, code language, obviously, for we don't like you, you know, or you're too loud or you're too flashy or you're too something. Um, but that that was sort of a shocker because I always sort of thought just deliver the results, be respectful, keep your head down and good things will happen. And it didn't. It did not. And what did you do when you got fired? What 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 happened next? Yeah. So I went home and drank. Okay. Classic. <laughs> Classic for a reason. <laughs> you know, why not? I went home and drank and felt sorry for myself for a day. And then, you know, I do remember, I absolutely remember thinking to myself, first of all, recognizing that success and failure are two sides of the same coin, right? The you're not a culture fit means you're standing out too much. Well, in order to actually get to where I was, remember, as we just talked about, I had to stand out. If I'd played the game the same way everybody played it, I never would have gotten to those senior levels. I had to, you know, see the research differently, have different strategies. And what's my evidence of that? Well, if you look up at the time, there were like zero women in senior leadership. And so I had to play the game differently. By playing the game differently, I stood out. And therefore risk losing my job. And you can't have, I wish I had the secret for, well, you can be super successful, but without taking risks, you can't do that. So the second day, I definitely knew at the time, I knew it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I knew I was going to look back on that day and be like, thank goodness. Why? Because honestly, I wasn't happy there. You know, if, if you're not part of the inner team and your leadership team and you feel out, that's not a good place to be. But I never could have left. I never could have called my dad and said, hey, dad, I have X tens of thousands of people reporting to me. We're turning around coming out of the financial crisis. I just don't feel like I'm part of the inner team. Yeah, and right. I just feel like I should leave. Yeah. Never would I have done that. But yeah. I knew this was a catalyst for me to do something different and bigger and more important. It's just at the time, I didn't know what it was. So how do you get from there to founding Elvis? Law, it was a law. It, it was not overnight. How did I get here? Well, people said to me when I'm on a little journey, you should start an investing firm for women. And I thought that is no, 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 no. Women do not need their own thing. And by the way, if I'm going to be honest, I'm a varsity player. I'm not going to do some, oh, look at us girls together. Uh -huh, investing. Right. I mean, there is mm -hmm. a way in which the idea could be seen as as patronizing, right? For sure. And when we launched, a double digit percent of women told us so. We had. Well, and it sounds like women. that was your first response, sure. just to be clear. And like, that is how. Why, why do girls work. need a special, like, yeah, we, I can we open can, a Schwab account? A Schwab is. A, we can do that. We don't need. Da, 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 da. But the issue is, we don't. Uh -huh. We don't. How did you go from, how did you go from thinking that's. Yeah. That's an insult to women to being, oh, that's actually something women need. How did you, how did you get around, from point A to point around, B? I, you know, I went around a corner and through a pasture and ended up. And the, the moment um, was actually when I was one morning putting on my mascara and just was sort of, you know, my mind is wandering. And all of a sudden, I, had, I thought, I'm going to have a big insight. And I did. <laughs> And the, the big moment. insight, Here it comes. I, did. Like, I don't know, sometimes this happens to me where I'll be like, so I'm about to, like something's coming together. And the thing that came together was that the retirement savings shortfall in this country is a woman's problem. It's a oh. woman's issue. Why? Because 80% of women die single. We live six to eight years longer than the men in our lives. Half of marriages end in divorce. We end up sadly alone. I mean, look at any nursing home in this country and you know this to be true. And so therefore, if there's not enough money for for retirement, it's us. Huh. Huh. So that in that universe, even if everybody has the same amount of money saved mm -hmm. at age whatever, 60, yeah. it's still yeah. a bigger problem for women just because women will live longer than men sure. and be more and likely to run out of money as a result. And by the way, add to that, if you want to back up, that women earn less for doing the same jobs. We take more career breaks and our salaries peak sooner. So there's actually uh -huh. compounding issues here as well. So I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm saying that is a problem. Huh. And eventually got to women have 30 cents of wealth for every, every dollar men have. Black women, a penny. 
Okay. So we talk about your, your listeners may have heard of the gender pay gap and it's 80 cents. The wealth gap, which is what we keep and what we have is 30 something cents to a man's dollar and going in the wrong direction. You've used the phrase, and forgive me if, if you're about to get mm-hmm. there, you used the phrase investing gap. What's, what's the investing gap? Well, there are two ways that we have built wealth in this country over time, right? One is real estate, in be- buying real estate, and the other is investing in the stock market. And when I look and, and, and at this and said, well, how do we close this gap, right? A lot of people are working on the pay gap, but this investing gap where women keep the majority of their money in cash is costing women hundreds of thousands, some women millions of dollars over the course of their lives. This is the issue. Ah, well, let me turn around. Yep. So you you touched on it in passing, but you said women keep the majority of their Mm -hmm. wealth in cash. Tell me about that. Like, is this a thing you knew before? Did you discover that in this period? So there were things I knew. So I, I sort of knew women didn't invest as men as much as men do. What I really knew, having run Merrill and Smith Barney, is that women leave the financial advisor they and their spouse have in the year after their partner's death or in the year after a divorce at a rate of 80 to 90 Uh percent. So I knew that men are very happy with their financial advisor, but women leave. What I also knew is the industry is aware of this. The industry's narrative around this, which I accepted, is, well, it's because women are risk averse. It's because women aren't as good with money. It's because men enjoy investing more. It's because women need more financial education. In other words, it's her fault. And Uh everything we as an industry do, the products we offer are super. They're super. Women just have this issue. Okay, so let's put together a marketing plan. Let's market at women and tell them they should invest. And I said, That, you know, I didn't quite happen that day with the mascara, but as I sort of process through it, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe that's what is going on. But maybe in an industry where 98% of mutual fund dollars are managed by men and 99% of investment dollars are owned and managed at companies owned by men and 86% of financial advisors are men, maybe they built a business for themselves. What if we center instead on women? What if that's what we build? And that was the genesis of LFS. Why don't we change the underlying product to take into account the thousands of different needs women have that, you know, the industry isn't. So that's the big idea. But how does it actually work? What specific problems do you have to solve to build an investing firm for women? That's coming up in a minute. Now, back to the show. In some ways, Elevest is pretty straightforward. You can join for a few dollars a month. They help you invest in low-cost ETFs. Or if you have more money to manage, you can pay higher fees and get a financial advisor. But of course, there is this big twist. Elevest is for women. And part of that is branding and marketing. But part of it is that they actually make different investment recommendations based on gender. I asked Sally how that part works. If you have a man and a woman with the same income, same net worth, same investing goals, why do you need different investing strategies? She lives longer than he does. Mm -hmm. Um, She um, earns less or her salary trajectory from the point, if you're saying they both are earning the same, her salary trajectory will be lower and her salary Uh will peak sooner. All things being equal then, some things have to be different. One thing could be that she, we give her a portfolio with more risk in it because she can afford uh-huh. to take that risk because of her longer life. But another change could be that she invests more, right? She invests, you mean a higher percentage of That's her exactly income? That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly yeah. right. So, and it depends on what she's comfortable with. Our uh-huh. solutions are highly customized, so she can do that back and forth. So yes, a there is that core difference in the algorithm based on yeah. gender. Yeah. But there are a thousand other small things in the product that are different. One of the things we learned is men will, if they see jargon in an investing flow, they will keep oftentimes keep going. Women uh-huh. will stop 
oftentimes and say, whoa, that seems important. So what we discovered is in the on the on, onboarding, you ask a man his risk tolerance. He's not sure. He takes an educated guess and continues. She stops and leaves. Oh, huh. I've got to figure that out. So we spent a couple of years doing deep research, finding those little points of friction, little points of friction along the way to make the experience feel effortless. So you start the company. Mm -hmm. Women are investing with you. You have, mm -hmm. well, at this point, you have what, a a billion, more than a billion dollars under management, right? More than, yeah, 1.4, 1. 1.5. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and then at some point, not that long ago, you have to raise a Series B, right? You want to raise more money to keep the company growing. <laughs> blah. Um, a lot of oh. people say, See, why, why blah? Why, what, tell me about why do you hate it's raising horrible. a Series B? It's terrible. A Series it's B, awful. just to be clear, it means raising more venture capital funding, right, mm -hmm. basically. Yep. yep. Why, why, what, why so bad? Well, you may have heard the research that says that women, despite women run startups delivering higher returns than men run startups, despite that, women raise just one, you know, four or five percent of venture dollars. Yeah. And Series B later stage, um, call it one percent. Okay. Uh -huh. So even less. Women, so so the gap between what uh, women founded companies mm -hmm. raise and, and men founded companies, it actually gets bigger once the companies are up and running. Yep. Um, which you think it wouldn't, because if the returns and the numbers are there, why not? But it's a that's a long couple glasses of wine about gendered expectations and all this th all the things. You have called this. I don't know if you made this up, but I, I saw it in connection I maybe with you. Did did you make yeah. up the phrase "Series B Cliff"? I didn't know that I did, but then somebody told me I did, and then I googled it. And I'm like, I think I made that up. And so, just um, to be clear, what is the yeah. Series B Cliff? So there is today a fair amount of capital coming in to fund women startup CEOs. Seed stage, that's when you have just the PowerPoint presentation. Series A, that's when you raise the first real chunk of money. Then Series B is when you tend to raise more. And the company's product market fit has been proven. You know, things aren't perfect, but you've you've got a real business here. You've, you, you're have you motoring along. You would think Series B, women would raise more because the numbers are there. But I hypothesize there are fewer people on the other side of the table. Venture, there's a fair amount of capital coming in at Seed and Series A, women funding women. They're very they're really much fewer women writing the big checks. Oh, okay? uh -huh. writing the big uh, Series so, B checks. Yeah. And so I I still found even at Series B, even with the numbers, and the numbers were good. The payback was within, you know, every marketing dollar we spent, the payback was took eight months. Is former CFO, you do that all day long. Yeah. But what I found <laughs> Was I still got, well, but don't their husbands and, well, you know, your numbers are good, but they're going to get worse because you're going to scale through your early adopters because your target market. I mean, like how many women really want to invest? I'm like, <laughs> well, pretty much like all of them should be. Um, and you still, you still get the, what if, what if Fidelity gets in? You're like, the market's plenty big, plenty yeah. big, right? There are plenty of multi-billion dollar wealth tech companies serving men. Yeah, I don't know. So the Series B is tough. So when you ask, why did you make a face when I talked about raising your Series B? That is why. That is why. Um, because the amount of time and, and just pain is tremendous. And so what happened in the end? Uh, I mean, that was not yeah. that long ago that you were setting out to raise this money, right? That was earlier this year, more or less? We, it, was, it was last year and yeah. then into early this year. And the women came to the rescue. It was the damnedest thing I've ever seen. We were out raising money. We got a great strategic, you know, sort of a bank, like, oh, we love what you're doing. We'd love to learn with you. We got an investment. We got it priced. So we had sort of the structure in place. And then I had a woman call me um, from out on the West Coast, never met her before. And she said, I heard from bup, 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 that y'all are raising money. I don't have enough. I'm an early stage investor. I can't reach your minimums. But let me make a proposal. What if I pull together my network of women and we huh. invest together in what's called a special purpose, uh, SP, special purpose vehicle? Uh -huh. um, but what if we do that? And I'm like, sure. 
And she said, I think I, we can raise X million dollars for you. And they did. And then someone in that network said, I've got a network of my colleagues and friends who love what y'all are doing. What if I pull together? And then someone that's, well, what if I pull together? And then along came Gangels, gay investors. What if we pull together? And we brought in hundreds of new investors through these special purpose vehicles and sort of found that in-between place between institutional dollars and crowdfunding where, you know, you, you can't really raise enough in order to raise a $53 million Series B investment and just buck every trend that was out there. Gives me chills. Mazel I've tough. got chills. I'm chill. Mazel I'm chill. Good. Uh, I know. Uh, I know. Okay. Briefly, what's mm -hmm. the next hard thing you want to do that you haven't done yet? Get all of us to profitability. Uh -huh. We... Um, we have reached what I think of escape velocity. We've proven the model. We've proven product market fit. We understand what it takes. Um, the issue with these wealth tech companies is they take a while to become profitable. You know, people come and they are with you for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So it's not like selling a t-shirt where you get all the revenue up front. Uh -huh. The revenue emerges over time. And They're so paying you you've got to get to a, a certain month now, and then they make more money, and they pay you more money later. So, is there a is there For a sure. time when you when do you want to be profitable by? <laughs> like, really soon would be really great. <laughs> but the the pro, the challenge with the economics <laughs> is you have to build out the whole thing before you get revenues. It's not like oh, I'm going to do a you know sort of an early version of information yeah. security, right? Or compliance. Yeah. You don't care if we're not compliant, do you? And but so there's you have a built that now, state. right? I mean, the, the, yes. the sort of minimum yes. viable product exists. So yes. So we just yeah. need to bring in more folks yeah, and get more money from existing folks. In a minute, the lightning round, including what to do when you get fired and a red flag to look out for when you're investing in the stock market. That's the end of the ads. Now we're going back to the show. Let's close with the lightning round. What's one piece of advice you'd give to somebody uh, when they get fired? It is the best day of your life. You just don't know it yet. And it's your job now to find the opportunities that are out there that sometimes come by you and you don't even see them and take advantage of them. Success will look different, but it can be even better. Makes me want to get fired. Um, you know? Well, if people don't want, you know, but if people don't want you there, you don't want to be there. You might yeah, just not no, have known a, it. That's yet. a that's really why. good way to put it. I didn't mean to be yeah. clear, but that is a really good way to put it. Mm -hmm. um, I have read in other interviews that you like to cook. Uh, I also like to cook. Uh, I'm not fancy, but I enjoy it. And I'm always looking for like quick-ish weeknight dinners. Do you have any tips or recent favorites? The Marcella Hazan tomato pasta sauce with the butter is a winner every time. It's every okay. time. And you can use it with canned tomatoes. It's even better than with fresh tomatoes. That's the kind of tip I can use. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. So the market is down a lot this year. I know I'm not supposed to look. I know I'm not supposed to pay mm -hmm. attention. I know I'm not supposed mm -hmm. to sell. But how do mm -hmm. I not do that? You got a tip for how to Just don't not freak do out? It. Just don't freak out. Go for a walk. Do not freak out. It, it, presumably, the money you're investing is not money you need tomorrow. Otherwise, you need to be with Elevest because we would have put you in a less <laughs> risky portfolio if you need it right away. So do not look. Just don't. Sit on your hands. Going back to your life as an mm -hmm. analyst. Yes. As an analyst, what was one warning sign you never wanted to see in a company? Uh, when they would consistently beat consensus estimates by a penny every quarter. <laughs> when you saw consistency of earnings out of a financial services company, we talked about American General, AIG, they later blew up, Wells Fargo, Conseco, Citigroup to some extent. What it said is they were managing earnings because they're just it's just not that stable. And every uh -huh. one of them blew up. It's fishy. That's a fishy sign that, yeah, that it's not sure. what they say. For yeah, sure. Um, Bitcoin or Ethereum? 
Oh, please. Uh, Ethereum, because it uses less, less energy. Better for the environment. One piece of advice for women going into finance or other still male-dominated fields. If you can, the company you go into, look up. And if you don't see anybody in the C-suite who reflects you, just understand it's going to be much harder if you are the first. If you do see people in the C-suite who reflect you, it's still going to be difficult, but your chances are much greater. What's one piece of advice you'd give to someone trying to solve a hard problem? Get into the zone. See what's really work to approach it differently than others. It hadn't been solved in the traditional way because there's a reason for that. And so you got to come around the back or the side in order to get there. Sally Krawcheck is founder and CEO of Elevest. Today's show was edited by Robert Smith, produced by Edith Russelo, and engineered by Amanda K. Wong. I'm Jacob Goldstein, and we'll be back next week with another episode of What's Your Problem? Happy Thanksgiving.